Our song today is Swing Low Sweet Charity. That is requested by Pastor Lord. If you can understand the lyrics, two things come to mind. The author is enslaved, and the soul is crying out to cross over the river Jordan to freedom. I believe that he has accepted Jesus as his Savior and has found his salvation. Metaphorically speaking, the chariot and the angels are swinging down to pick him up and deliver him to enter heaven into the waiting arms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I look over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Coming for to carry me home. If you get there before I do, coming for to carry me home. Tell all I'm coming to you, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. And sometimes I'm in for to carry me home, but still my soul feels heavenly bound. Coming to carry me home, swing home, sweet child, coming for to carry me home. Galatians chapter 2. And Galatians chapter 2 will begin reading at verse 15. Galatians chapter 2, and beginning at verse 15. Paul writing to the churches of Galatia. In chapter 2, verse 15. He writes, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even when we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, 
Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, take by law, then Christ is dead in vain. Call your attention particularly to verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your work. Thank you for this day, for the music that we've had, for those things which we've been able to share. And thank you, Lord, that we also have been able to honor these young people who have finished a very important stage of their life, but are moving on to other and even larger things. We pray that you'll bless them and use them and help them to stay ever close to you, growing to know you and love you and serve you. Now, Father, bless us as we look into your word. Guide us by your spirit into all truth. And if there is a soul here who does not know you, may they open their heart and trust you in this hour, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. A year ago, maybe two years ago now, I came to understand something that I, I should have realized long before. I came to be aware of the fact that our life on earth is a training time for eternity. That is to say that all throughout our lives, we are going to school. Now, some people don't like school. I'm telling you the truth. Growing up, I didn't like school. Mm -hmm. uh, one day, uh, some years back, my wife was going through some things at the house, and she came across one of my old report cards from, I think, maybe eighth grade or ninth grade, somewhere back in there. And she looked at it, and she said, I thought you didn't like school. I said, I didn't. I said, as a matter of fact, I, I pretty much hated it. She said, you didn't miss a day all year. I said, nope. She said, why? I said, they told me I was supposed to go. I went. <laughs> it doesn't mean a lot. I just went. When a student enters their first year of high school or college, they're called a freshman. Now, that is because their minds are fresh and ready to be taught. The biggest thing that I learned during the first semester of my first year in college was that I had a lot to learn. Uh, I realized I didn't know much of anything. During the second year of high school or college, the student is called a sophomore. Now that word sophomore is derived from two Greek words, and when you combine those words, it literally translates into English as a wise fool. <laughs> now, why is that? Well, the second of those two words, the part that we say is more, is the root of our English word, more. <laughs> it really is. I'm not making this up, folks. What an oxymoron. A combination of contradictory or incongruous words. How can a person be a wise fool? Either you're wise or you're a fool. How can you be both? Well, this one is wise in the sense that they have had a year or so of learning very new things. They are a fool in the sense that they think they're finished learning. There's so much more. The third year, the student is called a junior. That student has learned more than the freshman or the sophomore. That student is near to having finished his course, but not yet. The fourth year is the senior year. Those in the fourth quarter of life are often called seniors. I've said this here a number of times before, and I've said it to other people. I cannot see the clock, so I do not know how much time is left on it. But I do know that half time is long past, and I think I'm in the fourth quarter pretty sure, maybe even late in the fourth quarter. The clock is ticking. Our English word, senior, comes from a Latin word, which just means an older man. 
But in English, we use the word to mean an older person, like a senior citizen, or one who is older than we are, he is four years my senior, or one who is a higher level or rank, such as a senior officer, or one who is in their last year of school before graduation. Some years ago, I was employed as a high school teacher, and I met a man who was just a few years younger than I, and he was a student at a well-known college. And I suppose he wanted to show me his superiority. So to prove his point, he said to me, I'm a junior in college, where are you? I said, a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> when a child is born, they come into this world with innocence. They need to learn almost everything. They need to learn how to crawl, how to walk, how to talk, how to read, how to write, how to learn. That child is in the clearest, strictest, truest sense of the word, a freshman. But as time passes, that child becomes a sophomore. After childhood comes that stage we call adolescence. I won't say a great deal about that. I think probably the best illustration I could give of that time of life is a slogan I read once. It said, hire a teenager while they still know everything. <laughs> As we grow, we become adults. That word adult means one who is matured in knowledge. Maybe the best illustration of that is that, that it also means, the same word also means one who has ripened. You hear people being referred to as having uh, being a ripe old age. Well, that's, that's not incorrect. Fruit that is ready to be harvested is ripe. It's ready to be removed from the garden or the orchard to be put to a greater purpose. That's a senior who is about to graduate. Whether we're talking about a senior citizen, a senior in school, or any other form of the word senior. When we graduate, we leave our school days behind and we move on to that place, that purpose for which we have been preparing. Our life on earth is training for eternity. When we begin school, we not only do not know much of anything, we don't know much of anyone. But as we continue through school, we gain knowledge and we begin to gain relationships with other students. Some of these are going to be people that we don't get along with very well. Some of them are not going to be people that we like, usually because we discover that they do not like us. Folks, that's normal. That's normal. But some of these are going to be people that we get along with quite well. Some are going to be people that we do like, usually because we discovered that they also like us. Some of them are going to be people with whom we build strong relationships. Some of those relationships are going to be so strong that they're going to last far beyond the day of graduation. Some of the people we meet are going to be older than we are. And they will graduate before we do. Some will be younger than we are, and we will graduate and move on while they still have some learning to complete. And that, my friends, is life. And sadly, there will be some who drop out along the way. I remember my high school graduation, we were having a rehearsal for the graduation ceremony. And all of us who were seniors were there, and uh, we were getting ready to practice. And I noticed sitting off to this side over here, there were in the bleachers, there were a few students sitting over there. They were also classified as seniors in the same school that we were in, but they were sitting over there because they were not going to graduate. And to be honest with you, one of those people in the individuals in particular was not somebody that I was extremely fond of. Why not? Well, we've been in a couple of fights with each other. <laughs> had a lot to do with it. But I felt bad for them. Because I, as you might have already figured out, I was not the best student, but I was able to graduate. And I looked at them and I thought, they, they don't get to. 
They're not going to march when we march. They're not going to get the diploma when we get it. Some drop out along the way. The wise student will make the best out of their years of learning so that they can be prepared for life after graduation. Now all that's introduction. I want to talk to you this morning about graduating from the School of Life. Many times over the years there have been people who have visited the church here and when they learned that I'm a pastor quite often they'll, they'll ask me, so where did you go to school? Now I fully understand what they are asking me and why they're asking me. They want to know what college I attended and or what graduate school I went to so that they can have an idea of how orthodox in their view my training has been. Now I get that, I do. They, they want to make sure they're in a church where they're going to feel comfortable and so forth. And if I tell them where I went to school, if I say, well, I went to Tennessee Temple University and Pensacola Christian College and then beyond that to graduate school, then they feel that they at least have a ballpark idea of what I believe in practice. Now that's quite understandable. But in between you and me, I like to have fun. I do. So when somebody uh, who doesn't know me says, so where did you go to school? I said, well, I went to McFarland Memorial Methodist Kindergarten. Then I went to Cedar Hill Elementary School. Then I went to Northcrest Elementary School. Then I went to Tedder Elementary School. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Deerfield Junior High School. Then I went to Pompano Beach Senior High School. And usually before I get that far, they'll say, no, 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 that's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what they mean. Mm -hmm. But I still like to have fun. Mm -hmm. So when they take the time to explain to me what I already know, and that is what they meant by the question, I'll say something like this. Well, I went to Tennessee Temple University, then I went to Pensacola Christian College, then I went to Great Plains Baptist Divinity School. Man, I'm educated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that make you feel any better? <laughs> I like kindergarten, to you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Evangelist Lester Roloff was a graduate of Baylor University. On one occasion, a man asked him, said, Brother Roloff, do you have any formal education? He said, yeah, but I got over it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in this life we need four things to graduate successfully. When I say successfully, I don't necessarily mean being rich and famous. That's how a lot of us especially Americans view success. If you're rich, you're famous, you have success. Now, I'm not saying this is true of everybody. I'm sure it's not true of everybody. But there are a lot of people who are rich and famous who aren't very happy. So you have to ask yourself, is that truly success? Now, I'm not saying that all rich and famous people are unhappy. I'm sure some of them are quite happy. And good for them. But there's quite a few who aren't happy. Again, I believe there are four things we need to graduate successfully in this life. Number one, we need faith. Number two, we need a sense of humor. Number three, we need courage. Number four, we need to learn how to work. Look at Galatians 2.20, if you would. Hope your Bible is still open there. In Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul is writing, and the first thing he says, I'm crucified with Christ. What he is saying there is this, was, was Paul there when Jesus was crucified? Remember, Jesus is crucified, and, and there are two other men crucified with him. Was Paul one of those two? No, he was not. As a matter of fact, as, as near as I've been able to determine from study of the Bible, Paul wasn't even in Jerusalem on the day that Jesus was crucified. There's no indication that he was. So what does he mean when he says, I'm crucified with Christ? What he means is he identifies with the fact that Jesus died on the cross for his sins. Paul said, and you and I can say the same thing. We're crucified with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sin. I was talking to Sunday school hour this morning and talk about lying and, and people who are liars. And I said, most people, maybe not the people in this room, but most people at some point in their life have told a lie. And I said, you're probably asking yourself, well, is the preacher ever told a lie? And the answer is yes. I'm not proud of that. But it's true. I didn't want to say it in Sunday school. I don't want to confess 
things, but I, I, I will tell you the lie I told. I will. I'm, I'm not proud of it. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just being honest. As, as some of the preachers like to say today, I'm going to be transparent. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not true. I'm not transparent. You can't see through me. <clears throat> you probably wish you could, but you can't. <laughs> when I was 15 years old, I wanted to get a job. But in order to get that job, you had to be 16 years old. So I filled out an application. I lied on my application. I told them I was 16 instead of 15, and they hired me. So I went to work at 15 when I wasn't supposed to go to work until I was 16. Now, you know what that was? That was a lie. Now, you're waiting for me to make some excuse and cover it up. Well, there is no excuse. <laughs> there really isn't. It was a lie. Was it wrong? Yes, it was wrong. Now, of course, that is the only lie I've ever told in my whole life. Boy, that bothers me that you don't. <laughs> no, it isn't, I'm sorry to say. But I really, and I know what you're thinking. You think, man, I came and made the effort to get out here in the rain and come to church this morning and listen to a liar. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> but I try not to make a habit out of it. I try really hard not to make a habit out of it. As a matter of fact, the motto of our church ministry here is where the truth makes the difference. And that's as it should be. We should tell the truth. You and I, as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be the most truthful people anybody else knows. And sometimes, to be quite frank about it, as opposed to being George or Tom, mm -hmm. but sometimes, to be quite frank about it, it's not comfortable to tell the truth. You'd rather not. So what do you do? You tell the truth anyway. Tell the truth anyway. My freshman year in college, I took a class, and one of the requirements in that class was that during the course of a semester, not a year, a semester, you had to read the entire Old Testament. Now it came time for the final exam. I had a good grade average in the class. Beyond just plain passing, I was doing all right in class. But the last question on the final exam was, have you completed reading the Old Testament? Now, the truth is, I was in the minor prophets. I was close to finish, but I hadn't finished. And I knew, because we were told ahead of time, that no matter what the grade average was, no matter what else you've done, if you said no to that question, you automatically got an F in the class. You failed. But it'd be real easy to say, yes, I have. I'm close. I'm in the minor profits. I'm almost finished. Say yes. Get your good grade. Get your three credit hours. Move on. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I answered the question, no. What happened? I got an F. Failed the class. Really? I told that story once, and one man said, I don't like that story. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I should have finished the reading. <laughs> I should have done it. Mm -hmm. Wasn't going to lie about it. You may not like that story either, but what I'm trying to get across to you is we need to tell the truth, even when it's not comfortable to tell the truth. Even when it might cost us something to tell the truth. You know, which thing would you do about class? I'd take it over. You know what? It was easier the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I already knew this time. And by the way, I finished the reading the second time. Learned my lesson. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Christ died for our sins. We identify with him. This is as if he died in our place because he did. Then Paul says, nevertheless. I like that word, nevertheless. Nevertheless, I live. Paul's saying, I, I'm crucified with Christ, but I'm here. I'm walking around. I live. Yet not I. It's not me. It's not that old man. It's not that old man who had his sins paid for at the cross. It's not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, here and now in this world, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Faith. 
You and I must have faith. I live by the faith of him who loved me. We need love. Paul writes 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest is these is love or charity. When we say charity, we think of, oh, that's giving money to a big organization that maybe helps out needy people. I saw something recently in a video I was watching, and I like what I saw. I won't name the organization, but a certain organization, I was asking people to donate, and it, it is one of those organizations that meets the needs of people around the world, feeds the hungry, and, and so forth. And here's what they said. 100% of money given to that organization goes to the people in the field. Now, why did I feel so good about that? Because most organizations, that's not true. Most organizations have to take out and do take out administrative expenses and pay salaries and take care of expenses. No, they said 100% of money given to help people in need goes to those people. Now, you've got to be wondering how do they do that. I know how they do it. They've got another organization behind them that pays all the expenses. So that the money given to meet the needs of people goes to those people. I'd be a lot more prone to give to an organization like that, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And that's what we usually think of when we say charity. And charity really just means love, and it means the highest form of love. It means that kind of love that gives of itself, that kind of love that is not self-centered, that kind of love that puts the needs of others before their self. That kind of love that looks at somebody else and says, I'm going to do what they need regardless of what I need. I'm going to help them regardless of what it costs me. Even if it costs my life. That's the highest form of love. <clears throat> Jesus put it this way, greater love hath no man than this. They lay down his life for his friends. So Paul says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of him who loved me. I live by the faith of him who gave himself for me. Why did Jesus say <coughs> greater love hath no man than this to lay down his life for his friends? Well, honestly, folks, once you lay down your life, what else can you give? There's nothing else you can give. There's nothing greater. There's nothing more you can do. You've done it all. We need to live by faith. And it's not just blind faith. <clears throat> I remember... I was a young person, a young child. I saw a movie. Honestly, don't even remember what the name of the movie was called. It was a, a movie made for children. But the, the theme of the movie was this. Everything will be all right if you only believe. That sounds good, doesn't it? Everything will be all right if you only believe. You know what the problem is? That's all they said. They didn't say if you only believe what. Or if you only believe in whom. They just said believe. Well, believing is faith, but faith has to have an object. You've got to put your faith in something or in someone. Just say, well, I believe. You believe what? Well, I just believe. It's kind of empty, isn't it? Paul is saying, I believe in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I believe in the same Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You must have faith. Secondly, you have to have a sense of humor. Psalm 126, 2, then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing, and they said among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. God wants his people to have a good sense of humor. He wants us to laugh. Proverbs 17, 22, the merry heart doeth good like medicine. In Psalm 2, we're told that God laughs at man's rebellion. Dr. Parker stood here, Dr. Monroe Parker, and he said, uh, talk about Psalm 2. He says, God looks down at man in his rebellion. And God laughs. He says, look at the little man here. He's almost cute. So that little finite creature thinks he can stand up to Almighty God. It's funny when you think about it. He's right about that. I tell you what, I believe God has a sense of humor. I, I really do. There's somebody asked me one time. After I've done a funeral, he said, isn't there any humor in the Bible? I said, sure there is. Hmm. And he said, well, I haven't seen any. I said, well, I haven't. Where did you see that? I said, well, 
Think about this. God needed to get a message across to the prophet and he used a donkey to talk to get a guy. I think that's kind of funny. I really do. You don't believe that story, why not? Well, donkeys don't talk. Yeah, that's what makes it funny. God used a donkey to talk to a man. The man wouldn't listen to anybody else. I think the story in, in Acts of the seven sons of Seth is funny. I really do. Where they want to cast out a demon out of a demon-possessed man. They said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, and the demon says, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And jumps on and beats him up. I think that's funny. <laughs> you may not, but I do. But I, I believe God has a sense of humor. And you believe God has a sense of humor, too. You just do one thing. Tell God what you won't do. And see what happens. God, I'll never... Finish that sentence any way you want to and see what happens. You're going to find out God has a sense of humor. You're going to end up doing exactly what, you know what? I said I never wanted to teach school. I told you I didn't like school. Why would I want to teach? I taught school for years. I said I never wanted to work in a church bus ministry. Ended up having five bus routes in my home, helping out with 25 others and being the bus director in the church. I said, I want to preach, but I never want to pastor a church. <laughs> I'm telling you, folks, God has a sense of humor. I said, I'm never going to get married. <laughs> I said, if I do get married, I'm not going to have children. <laughs> and you're really going to love this one. I said, my children will never eat chocolate. <laughs> Guess what happened? You know what happened. I don't have to tell you. You know what? I believe God has a sense of humor. Don't tell him what I'm not going to do. And he's going to say, oh, yes, you are. That's exactly what you're going to do. You know what? He's already right. <laughs> He's already right. I believe we need to have a sense of humor. I believe a sense of humor will get us through many things. I was many years ago. I was in an emergency room. I'd gotten a cut and I was getting stitched up, and uh, I made jokes about it. The doctor's in there. Some of me up. I made jokes about it. He said, How can you laugh at a time like this? I said, It helps. <laughs> it helps. So I didn't make a joke. I won't tell you the whole story, but he said, uh, When did this happen? I said, About four o'clock this morning. He said, No wonder you shouldn't have been in bed that hour. I said, I was. <laughs> <laughs> now you want to go hire me cut in bed. <laughs> we don't have time for that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, we need courage. Mm -hmm. We need courage to get us through the hard times of life. Joshua 1 9, the Lord said to Joshua, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Doesn't say everything is going to be great, everything's going to be fun. It says, He's with you. Isaiah 50. Verses 6 and 7 speak prophetically of the life of the Lord Jesus. Where he says, I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. You know what that means? I set my face like a flint. It means that I've got my face focused on the goal and nothing's going to turn me aside. When I first went to the School of Christian College, first day I was there as a student, I've been there for other things before, but first day there as a student, I walk out the soccer field. And I stood at one end of the soccer field and I looked at the goal on the other end of the soccer field. The reason I was on the soccer field is they didn't have a football field. But uh, I was there and I looked at the goal at the other end of the soccer field. And I imagined it wasn't there. I didn't see it. I didn't have a vision. I just imagined 
But in that goal at the other end of the soccer field was my diploma. And I said to myself, I said, I am going to get from here to there and nothing is going to stop me. Folks, that's how you've got to look at it, life. That's what it means when he says, set his face like a flint. Now you're in Galatians. Look at chapter 6, if you would. Galatians chapter 6. And don't worry, we're just about finished. Chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially <coughs> unto them that are of the household of faith. Now, God willing, we'll say more about that tonight. But what Paul is talking about here is this. Keep on the path. Keep going. <coughs> in due season you'll reap, if you faint not. <coughs> We need to earn our money through work. Work is not a bad thing. Somebody says, oh, work's a four-letter word. Yes, so is love. The fact of the matter is, we need to work to earn our money. And I found out a long time ago that working to earn the money you need is not always doing something you want to do. Sometimes you just need a paycheck. We need to work to earn our money. I was going to share a scripture with you on that this way. Paul wrote Galatians, came to the last book that he wrote, 2 Timothy, and he says, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. That's exactly what we need to all say when we get to the end. Not long after he wrote those words, it was the end of his life. He graduated. From the school of life to that place where he had been prepared to go. We have faith, <clears throat> we need love, we need a sense of humor, we need courage, and we learn to make. make uh, we learn to work, I meant to say. We'll make it. It all starts with having faith. In all honesty, before I was led to Christ, before I was led to know the Lord Jesus, I didn't have any direction in life. Oh, I had a few things I wanted to do, but they weren't high and lofty goals. Like a lot of people, I thought I'd go to work. Nothing wrong with going to work. Earn enough money to live. And get by. Again, nothing wrong with that. But maybe God wants you to do a little bit more. Maybe he wants you to have faith. Maybe he wants you to have a sense of humor along the way. He definitely wants you to have courage. And he wants you to finish your course. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time we've had together this morning. Now, Father, I pray that you'll help us to take an honest look at our own life. Whether we're in the first quarter, the second quarter, or half time has already passed. Lord, let us look at what you would have us to do. Lord, it may be, we know just about everybody here this morning, but it may be that there's somebody here who in all honesty would say, I'm not sure. When I come to the end, when it's graduation time, I'm not sure where I'm going next. Maybe they're thinking, when I breathe my last breath, when I close my eyes for the final time, I hope to go to heaven. But I'm not certain. If such a person is here this morning, it is my prayer that right now, right where you sit, you would open your heart and you would do what the Bible says. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In your heart, call upon him. He knows what's in your heart. Call on him and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you love me. 
I believe that when you died on the cross, you paid for my sins, the things that I've done wrong. I believe that you rose again. And right here, right now, I'm trusting you as my living Savior to forgive my sin, to save my soul, to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer with you, maybe you didn't. Maybe you still have questions. That's fine. We're about to sing a hymn as we do. I'm going to leave the platform stand down front. You'll come meet me there. We'll have somebody take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that your sins are forgiven, that Jesus is your Savior, that heaven is your home. We're not asking you to join this church. We're not asking you to go through some ritual. We're asking you if you want to know for sure that your sins are forgiven, Jesus is your Savior, and you have a home in heaven. If that's you this morning, you come and we sing. Don't wait. Don't wait to see what somebody else is going to do. As soon as we begin to sing, you step out and meet me down the front. We'll help you. Won't take long. You're not going to miss anything this afternoon. But it may change your life completely and give you that assurance that you need. You're here this morning, I suppose, is the case for most of the folks here. You say, Preacher, I'm saved. No doubt about it. Thank God for you. But may the Lord speak to you about something in your life. May the Lord's dealt with you this morning. And you need to do business with him. Let him do business with you. This is your time to respond. You come while we sing. Father, bless and move this invitation time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're singing this morning.